Uh, welcome to this technical workshop on uh, ArcGIS GeoEvent Server and how to use GeoEvent Server to apply real-time analytics to your workflows. Um, my name is Ken Gorton. With me is RJ Sunderman. We are product engineers on the real-time and big data team at Esri. And RJ's in Redlands and I'm in the Washington DC office. So this afternoon we'd like to go over a number of things about uh, real-time an analytics in, in GeoEvent Server and we'll start out with giving you an, an overview of what real-time analytics really uh, deals with and what we talk about, what we mean when we talk about real-time data and uh, real-time analytics. Then we'll go through a few use cases and we'll uh, try and, and outline some of the some examples of how you could put different analytical tools together within GeoEvent Server to you know to, to realize your real-time workflows and then we'll work, go over some tutorials and additional resources that you can uh, return to online uh, after the, the session. And uh, so how does that sound? Sound good? All right. So why don't we get started? We're talking about uh, real-time analytics. And so what we really mean uh, by, you know, how GeoEvent Server implements that is, uh, is really, there, there are really three things that GeoEvent Server does. Uh, for ArcGIS Enterprise in implementing real-time uh, data flows. Now the first of those is getting data into the, your enterprise, getting data into GeoEvent or into ArcGIS so that you can do something with it. And this happens in real time. We have connectors that'll bring data in just as fast as the data is produced in real life. Um, or more specifically, just as fast that data can be, can be brought to GeoEvent Server or as fast as GeoEvent Server can reach out and fetch it. So that's ingestion is the first of those. The second of those is analytics, and that's the bulk of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, analytics is, is inquiring and interrogating that data as it comes in, uh, and doing so in real time as well. So just as fast as the data is coming in, we're examining it and looking for uh, key bits of information. And the third uh, component of, of real time data is sending out new streams of data to other destinations. And that might be to a storage medium such as a, a data store or a spatio-temporal big data store uh, or even a feature service. Uh, it could be to a visualization medium, uh, sending it to a, a, again to a feature service or a stream service that you, so you can see your data on a map. Uh, and we can also send actuation commands, and this could be to uh, devices or nodes on an Internet of Things on your network of devices, or it could be uh, email uh, messages or text messages and, and so forth. So we, we, th these three things, getting data in, analyzing it, and then sending out new streams of data are really the, the, the three pillars, the, the three legs of the real-time stool that we're dealing with. So when we talk specifically about real-time analytics, we're, we're, you know, we're assuming the data is already in and we have something set up so that they can go back out, but uh, the analytics are taken care of in, uh, in the context of a GeoEvent service. And a GeoEvent service that you see here, a, a diagram on the screen, is, um, is composed of uh, various uh, GeoEvent elements, components, uh, including the inputs and outputs, but more specifically with the processing nodes and the filters that you see in the yellow rectangles and, and, uh, and diamonds here. Uh, the, uh, the role of an input connector is really to, to take an input stream of data and convert it into discrete uh, messages that we refer to as geo-events. And then the, these geo-events are acted upon by the various nodes and filters within a service uh, before being sent on to the, the outputs that, that you configure. Uh, so this is an example of, of what a, uh, a service looks like. You, you build these and you modify them in a geo event uh, in, in the designer, much like you'd interact with uh, components in, in Model Builder and ArcGIS Desktop if you're familiar with that context. Now there are a number of processors that we can leverage within uh, a geo event service and uh, many of these are available uh, out of the box. Uh, and we'll, we'll go through many of those. There are also uh, additional processors that you can access uh, through the uh, GeoEvent gallery or through other uh, third-party uh, sources. Uh, many of these are available for download right now. Uh, today we'll be talking about a number of these. Uh, out of the box we have things like the, uh, uh, the, uh, a buffer processor that'll take an incoming geo event, buffer that geometry, and as GIS users you're, you're familiar with buffering. So it, it's, uh, it's representative of a, a number of processors that act upon the geometry of a geo event. 
Other processors will act on the attributes. They'll, they'll uh, enrich a field with, uh, with data joined from a, an external feature service. They, they may calculate a field based on incoming fields or, or based on uh, 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 you know, other functions that you can apply. Uh, some processors will, will react to conditions that are present within a geo event. And these could be spatial and or attribute conditions. And when certain conditions are present, they'll, they'll fire off a different kind of geo event than, than that which is coming into the processor. Uh, other uh, third parties, other partners, uh, other uh, individuals within Esri, uh, and as well as contributors from the, from the community, many of you uh, have written additional processors and other components for GeoEvent because uh, uh, GeoEvent includes a software development kit uh, that you can use to, to write your own Java code to develop your own components. So if you don't find something, a processor that's uh, available uh, already ready to go for you to configure, you can al always build your own. So here's an example of a, a workflow that, that uh, leverages a number of different analytics within GeoEvent Server. This is a construction zone. You see a number of construction vehicles, and they're moving about the construction zone. Uh, as they move about, they, they leave a, a little yellow breadcrumb trail behind them so you know where they've been. Uh, you notice that some of them are, are moving from one construction zone to another, and as they do so, we see a little uh, blue information icon pop up that tells us you know, a bit of information that they've moved from one place to another. Uh, one vehicle here on the, the right-hand side has actually left the construction zone and, and then re-entered, and that represents a potential safety violation that, that a supervisor would definitely want to know, so that represents a, a sort of a, a different level of alert. So there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes here. So I want to let's go behind the scenes and take a look at this uh, at a service that that would approximate this this uh, uh, workflow. So in the upper left we have the green in uh, incoming data, the 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 input connector that receives the information from these construction vehicles. Now they're sending their location, they're sending certain vehicle diagnostics uh, and, and other information. But as that information comes in, we immediately forward it to an output connector that simply allows us to update its location on a map. And that's why we see the vehicle moving from one place to another. All right, it's very simple. It's input connected to an output. Now, we can also uh, geotag the, the location of each one of these incoming uh, geo events with the construction zone that it's currently located in. And that assigns the, the identity of that construction zone to that, that uh, vehicle uh, message uh, so that we know that that uh, uh, you know what zone is currently located in, and then we can write that information out to an archive, some sort of storage medium, and that's what allows us to display the history of where it's been, that breadcrumb trail that appeared on the map. When a vehicle changes zones, we can we can detect that uh, using a, yet a, another analytic tool, uh, a processor within GeoEvent Server so that we know, the, the, the construction supervisor might know that uh, a certain vehicle has moved from one zone to another or uh, and, and to subsequent uh, zones later on. Uh, in the case of that one vehicle that left the construction zone completely and then re-entered, uh, representing a, a potential safety violation, this is a, a higher level alert that might send an email to that supervisor. Uh, and in that case, you know, they could he or she could take action and, and, and find out what was going on and, and so forth. Now, something that wasn't really represented in the video, uh, but that I mentioned, that the vehicles can send not only the location, but certain diagnostic information about their, their status. Uh, if that message includes a, a fuel status, uh, the, the uh, GeoVent server can detect that, and then this filter here represented by the diamond simply says, does the, the, the fuel status attribute indicate low or adequate? And if it says low, then we can send an email maybe to a, a, a logistics, a, a fuel truck, for example, and we can have a, a fuel truck go out there and service that vehicle and, and fuel it up. So that wasn't represented there, but it is another um, uh, way that, you know, a type of analytic that we might uh, leverage in GeoEvent Server. So uh, just want to wrap up with a few notes about processors and filters. Now processors, uh, and we saw both of those in these examples, but processors tend to, they want to uh, act on a GeoEvent message and then forward that GeoEvent message onto the next node within the processing chain or to an output. Uh, and uh, you know, they, they might act on an attribute field or they might act on the geometry of a GeoEvent. Uh, 
in fact, they may in, in, uh, indeed uh, interrogate that geo event for certain conditions. Did that geo event indicate that the, the, uh, a moving vehicle entered a certain zone, for example? Or is, the, uh, is some attribute about that geo event indicating the temperature or the humidity or something outside of a certain range of conditions that, we, that, we've, uh, uh, that we've said and that we're watching for? In that case, it, it might send off a, a different kind of geo event message entirely. But the, the bottom line is processors want to promote the flow of geo event messages through the service. Filters, on the other hand, tend to want to throttle the th flow of, of messages. They, they'll, they'll set a, a set of con uh, conditions, and these again could be spatial and or attribute conditions. And as long as those conditions are met, the, ge the, the filter will allow that geo event to pass and it won't change anything on it. It simply says, you know, determines whether or not it will pass or not. If the condition is not met, it, is, it halts the, uh, the flow of messages. So this is very useful, in, especially in, in conditions where you have maybe a high flow or high volume uh, of data. And most of it is stuff that's, you know, it's good to know, but it's not really the, the important messages. Um, when a temperature sensor continually indicates that temperature is normal, that's great, we're happy about that, but what you really want to know is when the temperature is too high or too low for your servers to function properly, and that's when you want to get an alert, and so the filter would allow that, that one bit of crucial information to pass uh, before your servers melt down. Uh, now filters, as well as the processors that use conditions, uh, can have uh, yeah, complex expressions and um, um, you can bundle these expressions together using and, uh, or, and, and not statements so that you can bundle multiple expressions together into more complex filtering uh, conditions. Now in the case of, of spatial condition that you set within a filter, um, generally speaking, the, these are going to act, uh, compare the geometry of a geo event with the geofences that are part of your server. And we'll talk about how to get geofences in, into a geo event server. But basically, it, it's uh, checking for a spatial relationship between the geo event and one or more geofences that you have. And in this example that you have here, we have a category of geofences called delivery area. And the, the syntax that you see here, the delivery area, delivery area slash dot star indicates virtually any delivery area geofence that's, that falls within that category of delivery areas. And we're, we're looking for it, whether or not this geo event message is disjoint from all of them. In other words, is it completely outside of any delivery area? The key here is that, that operator all in that, and uh, I want to go into that a little bit. Uh, in any case, uh, the, the, you know, we have a couple of operators, all or any, and specifying which of those is an important step in setting up your filters. Uh, basically, in this, this case, intersects all requires that uh, a geo event would, ha would overlap with virtually every single uh, geo fence uh, in, uh, in the category in question, whereas the any operator uh, says it will be satisfied if it intersects or is, in this case, disjoint with virtually any one of them. Uh, to illustrate that a little bit, we have a, a graphic here. This red line represents a track of geo events uh, sequentially moving through an area. Uh, the uh, polygons represent the various geo fences that we have here. So if we're, we're testing for an intersection with any geo fence, then in this case, four of those geo events satisfy that condition by intersecting with any of those geo fences. Whereas if we're testing for an intersects all, in this case, uh, only one of those geo events intersects with all of those geo fences, and that only by virtue of the fact that those geo fences overlap one another as well. So we have a number of spatial operators that you can leverage. There are about a dozen of them in uh, geo event server. Uh, things like inside, outside, <clears throat> excuse me, enter and exit. And many of these spatial operators are you, you are familiar to you from other. Uh, aspects of, of ArcGIS that you're familiar with, so we won't go into them, but just to be uh, safe to say, there are a number of them you can leverage uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to test for your desired spatial uh, relationships. 
So a word about geofences. Uh, geofences are uh, spatial um, representations of geometries that are in memory within GeoEvent Server. Uh, and there are a number of ways that you can get them into GeoEvent Server. And the easiest one is simply by importing a, uh, a feature service the features of a feature service into GeoEvent Server. And this becomes, they become static geofences at that point. Uh, uh, a good thing to remember is that geofences can be points, lines, or polygons. They're not limited to polygons, which is what a lot of people immediately jump to, to and, and, and think about. But by importing these uh, geofences, you end up with static uh, geometries within a GeoEvent Server. But what happens if the, the features in that feature service change at some point in the future? Uh, there's, you know, this would essentially orphan a lot of your, your geofences and, and not keep them up to date. So the, the remedy to that is to set up a synchronization. And that uh, uh, tells GeoEvent Server to periodically go out and re-import those uh, those features, those geometries from your feature service. And that can be as, as often as every minute or, or so or as you know, infrequently as every day or every few days. You know, it's really determined by uh, what your requirements are. And this is useful, again, for when the, the, the data changes periodically. But in the real world, sometimes data changes very rapidly or in very high volume. And in those cases, a feature service might be insufficient to um, uh, to, to meet your, the, the, uh, the demand. Sometimes you know, feature services do have a, a limit in, in terms of how much data they can receive in, in a certain amount of time. Uh, and so they can become a bottleneck for information. Uh, and uh, here again, the remedy to that is to leverage a, an output of GeoEvent server known as a stream service. And by publishing a stream service, we can actually use those uh, to synchronize with our geofences and stream services are much more high performance than a, a feature service is. We can, we can uh, generate a much higher and much higher volume um, stream of, 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 of features through a stream service. And the, the, uh, the geofences then can ingest that just as fast as the stream service can, can generate them. And this gives us a, a much better opportunity to, to maintain synchronization between our geofences and our, uh, the changing data. So here's an example that applies to synchronized features uh, in, a, in a geofence, regardless of whether they're coming from a, a feature service or uh, uh, a, a stream service. Suppose we have a, a, a flow of data points that we periodically buffer within GeoEvent Server. And as we buffer it, um, you know, that generates, let's say, a no-fly zone, a, a flight restriction zone. Uh, as aircraft move through the area, we can quickly determine whether or not the locations of those aircraft inter intersect at all with our no-fly zone that we buffered. Well, when that point moves in a subsequent uh, iteration of, of our data and we rebuffer it, uh, that ge the geofence is automatically updated. And now when, when uh, a aircraft flies through on the same flight path, it might uh, actually inter intersect with that, uh, with that geofence. So this is an example of how um, you know, we can dynamically respond to changes in data by, by immediately uh, geofencing that, that data and being able to respond to that in, in real world conditions. So hopefully that gives a, a good background. Right now I'd like to turn it over to RJ and we'll, we'll start to take a look at a few use cases. Thanks, Ken. For this first demo I want to take a look at a scenario in which I've modeled out some electric transmission lines over an area and I have a storm that's inbound over that area. The electric transmission lines have been modeled as geofences and the polygon that is the storm is my real-time event data that is coming into the area. The analytic I've designed is going to clip portions of the electric lines in order to highlight them in the orange that you see there on the screen to show which portions of the lines are currently intersecting the storm. And then I also pull the entire line segment in order to buffer it and show as a highlight which total line might be affected when the storm enters the area. I'm going to exit out of PowerPoint for a moment and come over to my demonstration. So I have a running geo event service here and I have a running input that is going to be receiving data from my GeoEvent simulator. My GeoEvent simulator is sending over data that is a ESRI feature record, that's all the JSON that you see there in that yellow box, as well as a name for the storm and a date time. 
I've prepared a web map that shows the geofences that I've already imported into GeoEvent server as the electric transmission lines. And as I start to simulate events, you'll see that the storm begins to advance toward the coast. And once it intersects one or more of the lines, the process clips off the portion to display it in orange and buffers out the line so that you can see what the potential impact might be of the storm. And as the storm continues on inland, you'll see it in intersects more and more of the structure and we begin to highlight what the potential impact might be of the storm as it evolves. I'd like to take a look at the GeoVent service that is behind this now. So here you see that we have the Demo1 Storm Polygon Simulator as an input and it is sending data directly out to a stream service so that we can see that polygon draw on the web map. So far I haven't done any analytic, I'm just streaming the simulated data through to the web map. The first branch of the analytic uses the intersector which is a clip operation to clip out portions of the polylines that are my geofences and push that information into the record that I want to send out to a stream service to paint those lines that were in orange. The larger portion of the GeoEvent service uses several different processors. It starts with a geotagger so that it can identify which lines the storm currently intersects. It then uses a field splitter to generate individual events, one per line, because the geotagger gave me a comet separated list of one or more polylines that are intersecting. Then we do some field mapping, enriching to pull the geometry through, create the buffer that want to show in yellow, and then field map again and pass it out to the stream service for display. So what I'd like to do is take a look at each of the processors in turn that are contributing to this analytic, starting with a field mapper. A field mapper is probably the first processor that you'll be using when you're new and beginning to use GeoEvent. Why? Because you receive data in, in one format, one schema, and maybe it has more information than you want to pass out and disseminate. Maybe it is in a structure that is hierarchical, JSON often is, and you need to flatten that data in order to insert it as a feature record into a feature service. Regardless, what you do with a field mapper is take one schema and transition it to another schema. And kind of taking a look at this in slideology, so to speak, if I receive in a record that has a track ID, date, sensor, battery level, distance, duration, a fairly complicated event record, but what I want to pass out is just the track ID, date, geometry, and a category. So I can use a field mapper to take track ID and date, take geometry and category, and simplify the event record that I want to disseminate or pass out to those that are going to receive the event. Another processor is the field enricher. A field enricher is essentially an attribute join. What it's doing is it's taking the event record that you receive, joining to a secondary table based on some shared attribute in order to harvest or load event attributes, I'm sorry, not event attributes, but feature attributes from that secondary table into the event record. So the processor retrieves the specified values and then enriches the event. For example, I have a data record that comes in that has track ID, date, battery level, but I know that I have a secondary table that shares information on this track ID and is reporting other individuals with their track ID that are not supposed to contact this individual that is being tracked. And there's also information on areas that the tracked individual Victor 10987 is not allowed to enter. So I can use a field enricher to join on that track ID in order to enrich the event record with the area that the individual is not allowed to enter and the contact that they're not allowed to make. A buffer creator is one of our geometry processors. And it does pretty much what you would expect. It takes an event geometry and draws a buffer around it. 
So you can construct a polygon around an event's point, polyline, or polygon geometry, either enriching the event that you received with a second geometry or replacing the event's record with a new geometry. And that's kind of key when you start thinking about geo-event event records versus what we're familiar with feature records. Feature records can only have one geometry and they have to have a consistent geometry because when you go to publish the feature service, you're publishing a point feature service or a line feature service or a polygon feature service. But geo-events can have more than one geometry and you can actually change their geometry. In the case of the buffer, I can receive a point, draw a buffer around, replace the point with the polygon in order to send the polygon out a stream service that then I'm using to synchronize geofences, for example. Taking a look at this as slides, I have a geometry that comes in, I generate a buffer around it, and in this case I chose to enrich the event record with a new geometry that I called buffer. Up on the top we see that I was using a geometry intersector. And the intersector, like I said, is a clip operation. It generates a geometry that represents the intersection between the event records geometry and the designated geofence or geofences. And then again, I can either enrich the event record with the result of this clip or I can replace the inbound record with the geometry that was produced. So if I take a look at this, I receive a geometry, a second geofence, the intersection between the two, I chose to enrich the event record with that intersection. A second use case that I'd like to explore is finding patterns in data. And for this demonstration, what I'm going to do is load a set of geofences that have been modeled off as kind of a fishnet, a, a system of grid cells, and I'm going to begin simulating crimes for the DC area. I'm going to load a web map that I have prepared for this demonstration. Here's my pattern detection web map. And you'll see as this is loading, it's going to start populating that system of grid cells that I want to use for my analysis. This is an area that I've selected over the DC, Washington DC area. It's behaving a little slowly. There we go. So you see I have a, a system of grid cells here that have populated into the map. I'm going to be polling each one of these grid cells in order to ask a question of GeoVent, how many crimes have occurred inside this grid cell? And if that were the only thing that I were interested in, that's maybe a first level analysis. I could use the spatial temporal big data store to produce this sort of aggregation based on the statistics statistical count for me, but I'm going to expand and take this to another level in which I want GeoEvent to alert me when the number of crimes in a grid cell has increased beyond a certain threshold. When I return to my GeoEvent manager and I need to stop the inputs, outputs, and services for that first demonstration and start them for my second. So I have the three outputs that I'm using that are going to provide me a visualization of the crimes that are being simulated through my GeoVent simulator. And then a layer that's going to flag me on incidents when a high volume of crime occurs within an area. And then also an output that's going to update the count within each grid cell as the process runs and counts the items. Bring up my other GeoEvent simulator. And this one is going to be simulating 
crime data that was harvested for the New York area and then sanitized for this presentation. I'm going to be simulating the data at about one event every 100 milliseconds. So if we go over and look at the map and I click the advance a few times, you'll see that crimes begin to start appearing over the area. We're just going to hit play and pretend that there's a massive crime wave now striking the DC metro area. One thing that is key to this particular solution is the dynamic geofences that are being synchronized. So if I come back to GeoEvent Manager and look at site, I can come over to geofences and see that as of refreshing that screen, I have 181 crimes that have been synchronized as point geofences. Again, geofences don't have to be a polygon. And if I refresh that screen again, you'll see that the count increases. I now have over 300 geofences that have been synchronized. If I hover over any one of these, you'll see that the geofence has both a start time and an end time. That's really important because if you're going to be streaming and automatically synchronizing geofences into GeoEvent Server, you need some way of determining when that geofence is no longer relevant so that GeoEvent Server can mark it for deletion and eventually come through purge and clean up. So part of my real-time analytic is to compute a five-minute window and say this geofence is only in effect from now until five minutes from now. So let's go back over to my service and I'm going to turn on the input that is polling for the grid cells. And you'll see here at the bottom it's going to poll 5156 features, so 5,000 individual grid cells and process them, process them through this GeoEvent service that's actually performing the counts. And we'll take a look at what that GeoEvent service looks like in terms of its processors in just a moment. As I'm looking down, I have a thousand crimes now that I've simulated that should be sufficient that I have at least one notification of a high crime incident. So if I come over to my web map, you'll see that I have a flag that's appeared on my web map display. I can zoom in. And in addition to looking at any one grid cell, and seeing the number of crimes that have been reported in that area, I can click on the flag and see indeed there have been 13 crimes reported for this given block area. And GeoEvent is tracking now an incident that started at a certain date and time based on an opening condition of count greater than 10. So as that input is polling the feature service of the grid cells each one minute is how I have it set. It will process through the 5,000 grid cells and update this incident based on the number of crimes it counts on every iteration that as it runs. Go ahead and stop that simulation and pop over to slides to take a look at how that GeoEvent service was constructed. So here you see the GeoEvent service. It has a grid pull in. That's what's pulling in that 5,000 polygons for the analysis and is doing an immediate field mapping to prepare the data for event values that I'm going to write into that structure. Across the top, you see I first use a filter to detect whether or not this grid cell, this one square polygon, has no crime. If it has no crime, I'm going to use a field calculator to calculate a zero for the count. And then for efficiency, I'm going to use a second filter to test whether or not this count is different than the previous count. If it's different, then I'm going to go ahead and update the grid cell in the feature class so that when I click on the web map, I can see whether there's one crime or 13 crimes that have happened in this area. The lower analytic is what is the second level that I'm bringing to this particular demonstration in using a filter first to determine are there one or more crimes and then a geotagger to get the identifier of each of those crimes and a couple of field calculators allow me to count the number of crimes going on in that area. And then of course the incident detector has the opening condition. If I have more than 10 crimes, I'm going to output a flag to visually notify me that something has occurred. Let's take a look at what the geotagger processor is doing for me. 
Use a geotagger when you want to enrich an event record with the name or unique identifier of a geofence with which the event shares a spatial relationship. It's essentially a spatial join. So here we have a Temecula gangland. It happens to be a polygon. And I'm interested in detecting when event geometry intersects with the Temecula gangland. So I've received an event record. It has a point geometry. That point happens to be inside. So I enrich the event record with is inside and the name Temecula gangland. The geotagger in this case, as I said, detects when there is one or more geofences that satisfy the spatial criteria. And if there's more than one, it generates a comma separated list. So one of the things I have to do now is figure out how to count the number of items in that list. And to do that, I'm going to use a pair of field calculators. The field calculator is probably one of the most versatile processors that you can configure. You can do very simple mathematical or string operations in order to simply divide one value by another or, conc or concatenate two string values together. You can also do function invocations on string functions from the Java library that some of these accept regular expressions. With regular expression patterns, now you can do some really complex operations with your string manipulation. Looking at a simple example, maybe I receive an event record and the distance is reported in feet. But for whatever reason on my output, I want to report the distance in miles. So I configure my field calculator with an expression, distance divided by 5280. And now on the event record outbound side, I get a distance reported as 0.02 miles. In this demonstration, I was using the function invocations and regular expression patterns. And if you don't speak regular expression, don't worry. What I'm doing here is looking at the crime IDs, which was the output field, the, delimited, the comma delimited list of IDs. And I'm using the regular expression pattern matching anything but a comma one or more times. So basically, I'm taking every one of those integer IDs and replacing it with an empty string. This allows the second field calculator then to simply compute the length of the string, adding one so that I pick up the last item of the list, which doesn't have a comma. With that, I'd like to turn control back over to Ken for a third demonstration, which will look at entity tracking and rendezvous detection. Great. Thanks, RJ. Um, so if you look here, at, uh, I'll start out with uh, a little bit of demonstration to, get, to illustrate the, this use case. Uh, what we have here is a map of an area uh, and uh, my simulator will populate the map with a couple of uh, points and uh, one of the points will remain stationary while the other one moves around the map a little bit. A as it does move around, um, you know, this is one example of, of uh, you know, something that RJ illustrated where, you know, the simulator, simulator is providing the location of an entity and the map simply reflects its, its current location. Uh, but if I stop the simulator, essentially we're stopping receiving, we've lost contact with this particular uh, tracked asset. And uh, GeoEvent Server can, can respond to that and um, you know, send an alert saying, hey, we've lost contact with this, with this uh, particular tracked asset. If uh, the simulator continues on and uh, GeoEvent will realize that it's received new information from, from this particular individual and can fire off a, a, a an, uh, an alert saying, hey, we, we lost contact, but contact has been restored. They were uh, out of contact for 16 seconds. Uh, now, so that's, that's one thing that we will be uh, checking for. If, uh, if we zoom in a little bit and notice that as these two entities uh, approach uh, into close proximity with one another, GeoEvent can determine that the, that uh, that activity is happening, that they're interacting with one another. Uh, this we refer to as a, as a rendezvous, and this could be uh, uh, a delivery truck is approaching its delivery destination, or it could be something more nefarious, like the two ships at sea that have, uh, they have stopped moving and they're in close proximity one, with one another, and are they, uh, have they met up to uh, conduct a transshipment of, of, uh, of uh, contraband? So there are a lot of different uh, ways and, and reasons why we might uh, utilize uh, a workflow like this. 
So let me stop my uh, simulator here and I'll switch over to slides. And we'll take a look at, uh, at this use case in, uh, in the, in, in, and how GeoVent Server would, would, might be able to approach this. Now, as I mentioned, the simulator put out the locations of these, these, uh, these entities, and the first thing we did was simply uh, one message in, one message out. We generate a, an output stream that allows us to map the locations on a map. Now, this topmost thread here takes a look at, uh, it, it looks for losses in contact with, with these entities. And the, the first, and, and if it determines uh, uh, that we've lost contact with these, with these uh, tracked assets, uh, it will generate, it will open an incident, and that's, that's what allowed us to see that you know, the incident was open and then closed and for a certain uh, duration uh, that allows us to, to, to track the condition and the, the status of that incident. And then finally, we, we uh, uh, add a, uh, a street address to it, and that's what gets generated. So we'll take a look at each one of those processes in turn. The bottom thread looks for rendezvous. Do, do two or more of these tracked assets meet up at some point? Um, you know, in technical parlance, do these tracks converge in space and time? And if so, that's something we might want to know about. Uh, the the uh, rendezvous detector uh, determines that that condition has happened and then, and then it uh, generates an appropriate output. So well, let's take a look at each one of these processors and, and the one filter that we have here in turn. Starting with the track gap detector. A track gap detector is useful for determining when we have lost contact with, uh, with one of the, the, the tracks that we're following. Uh, this simply, it, 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 as soon as it receives the first message from a track, it, it continues to start watching for that, and, and it does so on a, a time basis. So if a certain interval has passed, and the, that's an interval that we would set, if that interval has passed and it, and it has heard, it received a, a new message from it, then it says there's no track gap and it doesn't do anything. But if that interval passes and it hasn't heard from that particular track in, in, you know, during that interval, then it opens a track incident. It says track equals, or gap equals true. It says the time and lists the duration. And that's the message that comes out of this processor. And this is useful for notifying somebody if we have indeed lost contact with someone. So the way that works is the, uh, in this case, the vehicle reported its location and the, uh, the, uh, the uh, track gap detector said okay. And the next one was within that, uh, that uh, time interval, so the track gap de detector said all is well and good. But as soon as that interval passes and we haven't heard from this particular track, track gap detector says gap equals true it issues a new uh, uh, geo event message indicating the last received time as well as the last re received uh, geometry location for that particular track. And then as, as each time that interval passes and we haven't received a new uh, geo event update, the track gap detector issues a new uh, message indicating that the gap continues to be true. And this will go on as long as that interval passes and we haven't heard from, from this uh, particular track. But at such a point as that that track resumes sending its information. Track gap detector determines that, that the gap is closed. It issues a geo event saying gap is false uh, and uh, indicates the last received time as well as the, the geometry for the location. And then as long as no new track gaps are detected, uh, it won't issue any further uh, geo event messages. If we do have a, uh, a track gap detected, the next uh, node in the processing chain here is a, an incident detector. Now an incident detector is very useful for responding to conditions that, that we determine are, are, are currently extant. And um, it, when it does determine that those conditions are, are present, it opens an incident. And now this is a case of a processor uh, that whereas most processors have, don't maintain any sort of state, they don't remember anything about previous geo events that have come through. Incident detector is a, is a, uh, a, a variation on that. It, it, doesn't, it, it does maintain state. So when a geo event message comes through and it determines that it's at a certain set of conditions are true, it'll open that incident and then with each subsequent message from that particular uh, a stream of, of messages, uh, the incident detector will continue to check for those conditions and if they continue to be true, will issue an ongoing uh, statement saying that this incident is still open. 
uh, at such point where that track issue uh, sends a message and those conditions are no longer true, the incident closes and uh, incident detector sends a, a message saying this incident has been closed at you know, this time and it's been open for such and such a, a duration. So uh, to illustrate how that works, we have an area here. This is a, a geofence. And uh, our opening condition for the incident detector says, as long as a certain track ID, Juliet 789 or 0, uh, is inside that, that's our opening condition. And that's when we want to open an incident. So when we receive a message from that particular uh, track, uh, in this case, they're not inside. So the in uh, no incident is open because the conditions are not present. Same with this point, because the, uh, uh, the, there's no spatial relationship there. They're not inside that uh, uh, gangland. But with the third one, that track is indeed inside that geofence. And so incident detector issues a, a new geo event saying that this uh, incident has been opened. The status has started. It gives the condition. It tells the description that it was started at the following date and time. And uh, it tells the track ID that triggered this. So as long as, it, with each subsequent message from that particular track, as long as the opening condition continues to be true, incident detector continues to issue ongoing statements until such time as that track moves outside of our geofence and the opening condition is no longer true. In that case, uh, in that case incident detector in issues a message stating that that incident has closed with a status of ended. Uh, the description tells us that it's ended and uh, it lasted for 40 seconds. And then, you know, the, as long as those opening conditions are, are, are continued to not be met, incident detector doesn't open any further incidents. But when that incident is opened, uh, and the, the next processing node in the chain here is a reverse geocoder. Now this is an example of a custom processor that you can download, uh, but essentially this takes a point uh, geo event message and uh, sends the geometry for that uh, message out to a reverse geocoder. And this is very useful when uh, you want to be able to report the location of something and the, the, the coordinate pair of longitude and latitude might be insufficient. Maybe you want a more human readable uh, uh, location, such as a street address. So this takes that point address or point geometry and sends it out to a re reverse geocoder and appends the geo event message with uh, those uh, the values of the street address values uh, for the nearest street address that it can find. And so in this case, uh, the uh, we simply receive a a point message from from this track. Uh, it takes the geometry value and sends that to the reverse geocoder. What comes back then is one address, and it's the nearest address that uh, you know that's within the, the specified threshold that we determine within the processor and it appends those address fields to the outgoing geo event message and that's what gets sent on to, to the either to the next processing node or to our output now moving to the other th uh, processing thread within this service uh, we're, we're looking for uh, rendezvous and this could be expected or clandestine rendezvous that we're, we're watching for. In e either case, uh, the uh, rendezvous detector is, is useful for being able to determine when uh, these two tracks have, have uh, converged in, in both time and space. Uh, and it, it's not just two tracks, it could be two or more. Uh, but when the, it detects a rendezvous, it issues a, a rendezvous detected message. And then if, if at such point somebody else joins that rendezvous, it will issue a joined uh, message along with the, the track ID for, the, for whoever joined that rendezvous. If somebody departs, it, so likewise it says such and such a, a party left, uh, giving the, the date and the time. And then when the rendezvous finally ends, if ever, everybody leaves, it issues a rendezvous ended message. So here's that, how that, that sort of looks uh, conceptually. And here we have a rendezvous detector where, uh, where as long as tracks, uh, if they converge to within 100 meters of one another, that's considered a rendezvous. So the first uh, message we receive, uh, obviously there's no rendezvous because there's only one person there. They can't have a rendezvous of, of one. Uh, but when uh, a second one approaches, they're not within 100 meters, so uh, still there's no rendezvous. But when this Juliet 789 or 0 approaches uh, within 100 meters of uh, the, the previous party, we detect a rendezvous is occurring. And rendezvous detector issues a message saying that a rendezvous has been detected uh, 
participated in by the following parties, the Victor and the, the Juliet parties, started uh, and the duration, or I've, since it just started, the duration is zero, but it gives the geometry of the, uh, the, the bounding ring for, those, uh, uh, for that particular uh, rendezvous. Now, when somebody else comes in, we determine that they have joined it, and Rendezvous Detector issues a join statement uh, along with the track ID of who joined this party, and the geometry is then updated saying that, that um, uh, indicating the, the, the new geometry and the duration also is updated saying that this rendezvous has been going on for 10 seconds. So if that party leaves, we issue a departed statement and update the geometry as well as the time and, and the time stamp. And then finally, if somebody leaves, we issue a departed as well as a uh, departed for, the, uh, for the, the only remaining person there because we can't have a rendezvous of one. And then since everybody's departed, we issue an ended statement for that rendezvous. And these are useful in case you're tracking the, the status of either these individuals or of the rendezvous in general in a database. That way you can close out, you don't have uh, orphaned records remaining in, in your tables or in your, in your feature services. So hopefully that gives you a, an idea of how you can uh, chain numerous analytics together in a number of different workflows. Uh, there are a lot of places you can turn for additional uh, resources if you're interested in, in finding out more about uh, uh, GeoEvent you know, analytics. Uh, but basically, uh, what we want you to take away from here is the GeoEvent server is the component of the ArcGIS enterprise that enables real-time analytics. Uh, within your enterprise and allows you to, to react to conditions within the, the data that you're observing uh, and, um, and re receive actionable in information about uh, that, that, uh, that data that, so that uh, you don't have to have an analyst, a human analyst sitting there watching for certain conditions. The, the computer can, can take care of that and, and alert you when certain conditions are present. So I'd encourage you to uh, look at the uh, number of the resources that are available online. There are tutorials that you can find in the GeoEvent gallery or in, uh, in codesharing.arcgis.com. Uh, you can search for a, a few keywords like GeoEvent or uh, um, uh, analytics and uh, also look for the, the uh, GeoEvent topics within our blogs on GeoNet and there are a number of forums that you can participate in to ask questions and, and, and uh, and see what other people's experience are and, and, and really obtain a lot of uh, useful information. The videos for a lot of the technical workshops during this conference will be available within a few days or maybe a couple of weeks, I'm not sure exactly when. Um, so I'd encourage you to also to attend any of the additional sessions that are, are uh, uh, offered. Now, we're approaching the end of the day today, but tomorrow there are still a number of sessions that you can uh, take advantage of and I'd encourage you to do that. Uh, as, uh, as your schedule allows. There is a survey that we would uh, definitely ask you to fill out for us. That it's very helpful for us to, to be able to, to improve uh, all of our technical sessions and find out what was valuable to you and uh, you know, where maybe we missed the mark at, at some point. So I'd, I'd definitely ask you to fill those out. We also have a survey that helps the real time and big data team uh, to determine the direction that we need to take our technology. So if, if you have uh, needs that, that uh, our technology is not currently meeting that you'd like us to consider, uh, this is a good place to, to let your voice be heard. Um, also tell us what, you know, what is successful, what is uh, where your pain points are, and this gives us a, a good insight into what uh, is working or not for you. I'd also like to take just a moment to plug this survey because I'm often asked, do you have a use case example for my industry, whether that is utility or whether that's snowplow vehicle tracking? And I'm so often talking with customers, helping them understand what they can do in terms of designing a real-time analytic, but we don't have a good catalog of use cases for the industries. We would really appreciate if you're using GeoEvent to let us know how you're using GeoEvent so that we can begin putting together demos that are more focused to your use. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we still have a few minutes. Uh, we're happy to take your questions if you have any. Yes, ma'am. When you were talking about the track gap analysis, the track gap doesn't have to be a physical track on a map, right? It can be a track of, let's say, you have a gauge that's supposed to report, and 
and it misses a window of, of reporting. That would be right. That's, that's exactly it. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be a moving object. It, it could be um, the, the tracker, meaning the, the stream of information that we're receiving from that sensor, whether the sensor is moving or stationary. If we stop, if we lose contact with it, that's a track gap. So it could be that it ran out of batteries, or it could be that it got smashed or by a falling rock or whatever it might be. So, Yes, sir? The question was, is there a feature count limit in terms of how many events you can bring in? Right. So GeoEvent is not storing data inherently, meaning there is no limit to the amount of data that you're bringing through GeoEvent. You configure the inputs to receive the data, and then you choose how you want to disseminate the data by configuring different outputs. An output might be add and update feature records in a geodatabase, in which case I suppose you're limited by the number of feature records you can reasonably keep within a relational data store or our spatial temporal big data store. In the big data store, you can store hundreds of millions of feature records in a traditional database, probably more like a few 10,000 before performance starts to drop off rather severely. But you don't have to write the data out to a persistent geo database. You can be streaming the data out of stream service, in which case there's no persistence whatsoever. And then you might be receiving a nominal 500 event records a second, and over the course of an eight hour day, that could be 15 million event records. Geo event is just processing what it receives without capping you on the number of input. Over here. So or a way to do that on the fly in this if I'm going to restate the question, because of the frequency of reporting of vehicles and a relative small size of a geofence, I might have a ping outside on the left-hand side and then outside on the right-hand side when, in fact, the vehicle passed through that area, but geovent might not have received the input it needed in order to detect is inside, but you still want an alert for crosses. In that case, I would probably say I would want to use an incident detector to output a polyline rather than a point geometry, so a continuous output that is using the points as vertices to build out a polyline. And then I send that polyline to do the coincidence, the spatial coincidence test using a crosses relationship to determine whether it actually crosses the geofence rather than using the individual points to determine is inside. So yeah, there are ways that we can do it and that's kind of the point of this session is that you have two dozen out of the box processors. How do you want to arrange them, configure them, and recombine them to produce the analytic you're looking for? Mm -hmm. Other questions? Well, Ken and I will be here for several minutes after, since this is the last session of the day. We invite you to come over to visit us at the Real Time Island, where we have additional demonstrations, product engineers, and our developers. Have a great evening. <laughs>